Hello everybody, you're welcome back again to the Reggae Appreciation Society. Call me biased if you like, but Reggae is the greatest genre of music on jazz green earth. It emerged from the grimy inner city ghettos of Kingston in the late 1960s. A Jamaican made form of music that took the world by storm before the end of the 1970s. This global takeover was led by none other than the great Bob Marley, reggae's most iconic pathfinder and ambassador. It became a worldwide phenomenon all through the 1970s, but truly broke into the world mainstream by the beginning of the 1980s, and then truly morphed into an art form that was at par or even more appreciated than others. It would be Bob Marley that would blow the glass ceiling wide open, and this epochal event took place on September the 19th, 1980, when Bob Marley and the Wailers, as opening band, totally outshined and grabbed the spotlight from legendary soul funk band The Commodores at the height of its dominance and popularity. Though not a competition of any sort, there was such a comprehensive gap in quality between both bands that many fans of The Commodores became reggae converts that night. Though not confirmed, there are even accounts that suggest that it was so bad that it even resulted in Lionel Richie, the band's then frontman, leaving the group about a year later. That show's success but was yet another example of the Tough Gong's vision and strategic brilliance as it finally won over the African-American audience that he had for years been longing for. Now let's take a look at the night Bob Marley and the Wailers outshine the Commodores. In the summer of 1980, Bob Marley was one of the biggest stars on the planet and was at the absolute top of his game. He had just released his 12th studio album, Uprising, which was the last release in his lifetime. To promote the album, Island Records organized the Uprising tour and the Top Gun with his crew was scheduled to hit venues all over Europe and the United States. By that time, Bob Marley and the Wailers were like an extremely well-sharpened katana. After countless concerts, albums and years on the road, it was simply unstoppable. After blazing through an incredible 34 concerts in Europe, the band took a two-month break and resumed on the US leg of the tour with a scorching performance at the J.B. Hines Auditorium in Boston on the 16th of September followed by a show at Providence, Rhode Island the next day. His next concert date was supposed to be a week later in Pittsburgh, but a chance suggestion and surprise deal would alter Bob Marley's calendar and get him on the same billing and stage with the Commodores. As said earlier, Bob had been strategizing on how to win over a strong base of African-American fans, who up until then had generally not warmed up to reggae music. He shared this vision of his with his former manager and producer, Danny Sims. Bob had met Sims in 1968, when Sims had traveled to Jamaica with Johnny Nash, who he discovered and was then managing. After meeting Bob Marley at a Rasta event, Sims signed the Wailers to a publishing deal for them to write songs for Nash. And though the arrangement hadn't been successful at the time, both men remained close pals and collaborators. Sims sold Marley an idea that he believed would not only win over an African-American audience, but also launch Bob Marley and the Wailers into the mainstream. American soul and funk band, The Commodores, had two concerts at the Madison Square Gardens in New York in a few days' time, and if he could perform as their opening act, he could tap into their fan base. Considering the massive egos that successful musicians normally have, the plan might have been rejected by most artists of Bob's caliber. After all, he was already selling millions of records and playing shows with the guaranteed few thousand die-hard fans screaming his name. He had even just finished a 34-day tour of Europe as the main man, so being a supporting act to another band should have been out of the question. But the tough gong from Trench Town was a true hustler and visionary and simply leapt at the opportunity as he could see the potential. Then it seems immediately went to work and called up Danny Crocker, a radio DJ and show promoter, who then worked at WBLS, a New York radio station that catered mostly to an African-American audience and were the organizers of the Commodore's concerts. Sims made a deal with Crocker, stating that he wanted Could You Be Loved of the Uprising album to be played regularly on WBLS in exchange for Bob performing as opening act for the Commodores for very little or almost no money. To Crocker, it looked like a sweet deal and he agreed to it. But interestingly, after the deal was agreed, many people close to Bob advised him not to play the show on the basis that it could damage his career. The unanimous reasoning was that the Commodores, being such a massive group, would outshine and diminish whatever star power Bob was trying to build. And when you really look at the profile of the Commodores, you could understand where these fears were coming from. The Commodores were one of the world's biggest soul funk bands and had ruled the airwaves for years with timeless classics like Three Times a Lady, Brick House and Easy. The likes of the Isley Brothers and even Bob's publicist, Charlie Comer, begged him not to go ahead with the show. But Bob's mind was made up. So on the 19th of September, it was on. 
The first act that evening was rapper Curtis Blow, who opened the show. And next up was Bob and his crew, who climbed the stage at Madison Square Garden with more than 20,000 people in the stands, with some of the biggest celebrities watching in the audience, in the likes of Dionne Warwick, Mick Jagger, Earth, Wind & Fire, and many more. The people in that audience were predominantly fans of the Commodores, and just a fraction were there for Bob and his band. Bob was a perfectionist, and normally did sound checks before his shows, but the way that concert was set up, he wasn't giving much room to put things in place. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that he wasn't giving much respect, but the second he and his band began to perform, the Top Gong's energy simply took over the stadium. He opened the show with a deeply spiritual, natural mystic and proceeded to rock the house and electrify the audience with 12 more songs that ended with an incredible performance of Could You Be Loved. And by the time he was done, the strong crowd were chanting Bob Marley's name over and over, non-stop. The audience was so thrilled that by the time the Commodores came on stage, they were still calling for an encore from Bob Marley. And to make matters worse for the Commodores, the audience seemed uninterested with whatever they had to offer. All the big stars like Earth, Wind and & Fire and Mick Jagger abandoned the show and went backstage to thank Bob Marley for the amazing performance and to get some pictures taken. That particular show was sold out, so another concert was held the next day with the same outcome. Bob totally took over the show. But for the Commodores, it would end up being a less than memorable performance. And the press, ably led by the New York Times, tore the Commodores to shreds. Marley, on the other hand, got enormously glowing reviews and a unanimous nod from industry gatekeepers who swore that what they had just witnessed was the next big thing in world music. Based on that performance alone, reggae and Rastafari had officially forced its way into the commercial marketplace and mainstream with Bob as a tip of the spear. But sadly, Bob would collapse while jogging at Central Park the next day and the much-awaited US tour had to be cancelled after one more concert at Pittsburgh and the Top Gun passed away from cancer eight months later. The Commodore's lead singer Lionel Richie left the band about a year after and there were speculations from the likes of Peter Tosh's manager Copeland Forbes that Richie's decision to leave the band and go solo was taken that night at Madison Square Garden. Interestingly, Lionel Richie was asked in an interview not too long ago about that night's concert with Bob Marley and he strangely replied stating that before the Tough Gun went on stage that he went to a changing room for a chat and walked into a cloud of smoke and got so stoned that he couldn't remember anything else. Like many reggae fans who have watched that clip, I think it's laughable and hogwash and just a way of avoiding talking about the Commodore's performance that evening. Now this video isn't designed to show the Commodore's any disrespect as they're a band I personally love and are definitely one of the greatest bands in popular music. But that evening, they were just unlucky to be on the same billing with the writing juggernaut of a musician and one of the greatest icons of the 20th century whose performance that evening was simply one of his stepping stones to immortality. So there you have it. Thank you for watching the video today. Please leave a like, subscribe, and until next time, jobless.